start coming to the realization that that particular approach had too many limitations. Um, we had a, a, a fixed library of shapes that was very confusing because, you know, there's, how many of them were there? Kidding. Shapes, uh, you had to pick from out of a menu, it was just kind of cumbersome, and we didn't have any um, level of detail technology, so uh, it only would show you this for the first few uh, 100 meters or so, and then it would just cut off. So we were looking for something else. Enter Miguel and his company, Fossify. Tell them a little bit of story about kind of how we met up with Miguel. So we were very fortunate. One of our designers on the team happened to run across Miguel's blog. And as we began to study what he had been posting about on his blog, where he was talking about his technology and its evolution, we had an excellent opportunity, one that happens fairly rarely in development environments when, we, when you're looking at other people's technology. And that is, because Miguel had been a prolific blogger, he had talked about his technology throughout its iteration. He had interacted with his blog community. I was able to go in, prior to every meeting or talk with him, Miguel, and look at not only everything that he had talked about from a technological standpoint he posted on, but also all of his community interactions. I literally went back to the very first day that he began blogging about Voxel Farm and his tech, and I read every single post and every single response to every single post that he ever had done throughout the entire iteration. So before Jeff just started him, harassing me about this point to go read the blog. <laughs> before before I met Miguel, I felt like I knew what he wanted to accomplish. I felt like he was a member of our team because in many ways his thinking and what he was trying to accomplish was directly in line with our interests. So even before we met Voxel Farm and we started talking to Miguel, it felt like it would be an excellent marriage. Uh, our vision for how we wanted to create the game and portions of Miguel's technology that could help us reach that goal. And so, as you've seen in the keynote and in the previous presentation, we're well on our way. Woo! So, we've had an excellent working relationship since then. Um, you know, a lot of the technology uh, that is developed in Miguel's engine is developed for his own uh, purposes and for his company, but a lot of it is also built for us. And we kind of uh, have this great sort of synergy where we, we have the pieces that he's building for us, and then we also see things, wow, that, that piece you just made on your own, we really like to use that. We think it fits really well with our game. And there's a couple things that he's built that we haven't felt would fit well with the game, and we haven't used them. But um, yeah, it's been a great working relationship. Um, so, Miguel, do you have anything to say about that love letter that uh, <laughs> I just wrote there? <laughs> Fanboy. <laughs> Does this work? Okay. So yeah, when I first heard about these guys, I thought they were crazy, you know, because I was just <laughs> going, you know, uh, and I had really just a couple of friends uh, helping me out, and you guys like really big, you know, and uh, coming from an MMO, uh, it's probably the most difficult kind of game you could build, so I, I, I thought, well, I'm in big trouble, you know, because these guys want to use this technology, and they want to play it probably the most difficult thing you can ever do in a game. So I, I say, well, uh, should I say yes to everything, you know? And they take all, they should take all the credit because they, they were really, they, they took a huge gamble on us. <laughs> all right, thanks, Miguel. Uh, so, what were the things about Voxel Farm that uh, made us choose it at the time? I mean, we've discovered many advantages since then, but the main issues were, um, it allowed us to represent a lot more shapes. Um, since it was much more freeform, the way the voxels were represented as opposed to the fixed shapes that we had in our old engine, it was much more flexible. Um, had a much longer draw distance. Uh, you know, as I said, in our old engine, we could only display it, display out for a few, under 100 voxels or so. Uh, whereas now we've got these distant uh, mountainscapes, and, and as you can see, you know, great, uh, as you all know, you're players, so the beautiful distance uh, capabilities. Uh, and then, Lastly, we had a whole procedural generation system in place so that we could save on data costs. In our original engine, every single little hill and valley, you have to save that on disk or transmit it across the network to you guys. Now that doesn't have to happen because it's all generated procedurally on each plank, um, except for the stuff that you change, which is you know, plenty of data there, but <laughs> you, want, you want to have that both. So how does all this stuff work? Well. Um, the Voxel system in Voxel Farm uses something called dual isochondry. And we're going to go kind of 20,000 foot view about how dual isochondry works. 
um, at least in practical sense for how you guys are going to use it. So basically, um, this has been described before in other documents that like Dave Dorsen published and um, in many of the videos, these concepts aren't new, but I just wanted to go over them because it's important how the whole system works. Um, basically, every voxel has a material, which is uh, a texture, color, uh, and it has an internal point that represents uh, where inside of that voxel uh, the mesh that is generated, which is what you actually see, is what video cards can, can display, is what's called a mesh, it's made up of triangles. It's the point in that, in that voxel that the mesh goes through. Um, so what happens is it, it, when we're going to build that mesh, it uh, puts it all over the neighboring voxels and tries to find places where there is a junction between air and non-air. And at that point, it, it creates a triangle, or actually a quad in this case, two triangles, out of the points on all those neighboring voxels that are on that border. It's actually pretty, pretty simple. It's just a lot of work. So the processor has to work really hard to do this. Um, that leads to all kinds of interesting things. Um, like microvoxels, something that players discovered. Uh, I've got the same, I've got Jeff disease, I'm getting put forward. It's hard to remember. Microvoxels are actually really simple. Um, every voxel can have only a single internal point in it, but a, what a microvoxel is, is when the points are very close to their neighbor points. What that means is you can represent a very thin line, however, you can't represent two thin lines in the same voxel. So, and the cool thing was is that you guys kind of discovered this and latched onto it as a way of making really interesting new things that our tools didn't really allow you to do very easily. It wasn't that the system didn't support microvoxels, it was more that our tools didn't really allow you to do it easily. But you guys found ways around that, which was awesome. You guys floored us every day we were seeing the new stuff that came out early on. Still do. So, one of the important issues with uh, any box system, but certainly con uh, also in dual contouring, is the concept of aliasing. What we call aliasing is something that occurs when the shape that you're trying to build, like in this drawing, the black outline, um, you can't, uh, let's say every single point is represented by an arrow. So you see the, the black arrows that are uh, coming from the corner of each box. Um, the upper right voxel in this drawing has two points in it. Well, you can't do that um, because the voxel only can only internally store one point. So you end up with a shape that you can't represent with, with the voxels in this case. So that was a, a, a fairly limiting uh, early on limitation of the system. But later, a couple months ago, we released something called roaming vectors. This is a fantastic idea that uh, Miguel and his crew came up with, which is where, um, as you see here in this drawing, uh, you can borrow the internal point from a neighboring voxel. So in this case, the upper middle voxel has two points in it because he's borrowing, represented by the green arrow, the internal point from the voxel in the upper right. Um, now, some of the tools that are uh, using this right now are, for example, when you place shape blocks, you're, you're placing things that are using roaming vectors to allow the greater resolution. It used to be that our shape blocks, especially like some of those chamfered corners and pieces, couldn't represent them most of the time because they, they had too, too high frequency of detail, which means they had too many points in them. But now with roaming uh, vectors, those come out perfectly. Um, the, other, the other tool that makes heavy use of that right now is the, uh, the line tool. Um, we have noticed in that same patch that we put up the roaming vectors, the line tool became much more accurate. Certainly has some, still can make some interesting shapes, we're going to be working on that in the future too, but um, much more accurate. And we're going to have other systems that come online here soon that will also be using uh, roaming vectors. All right, so enough about how dual contouring works. Um, one of the things that players, I suspect, don't realize is one of the major technical hurdles that came about this game. Most games these days are heavily pre-calculated. So if you have a level in a game like, I don't know, Mass Effect or something, all of those meshes, all the triangles in, the, in those meshes and the, and the textures that are applied to those triangles, they're all pre-calculated to be as optimal as possible. I mean, they have to run on consoles, which have much more limited resources than PCs. Um, so all that pre-calculation is something that we don't have the luxury of 
because everything can change on the fly. We can destroy things on the fly, you can build things on the fly. So um, how you display things in the, in the world in a completely dynamic environment becomes an interesting challenge. So one of those challenges is how do you apply textures to all these triangles in the world? Uh, other games do it in a, in a tool like Maya. You know, artists go in and they, they build those textures and very specifically an optimal. Well, in a, in a fully dynamic world, we use something called triplanar texturing. This is a really interesting approach to apply textures to arbitrary shapes. So what you do is you take that texture and on three different axes, you apply it and blend it with its neighbors. So for example, here in the sphere, you see the three textures and it, they get wrapped around like this. Um, it avoids problems that uh, earlier attempts at doing this have where you just do a top-down view, so basically just having a top texture. And the problem with that system is that you get, um, like on the side of a steep hill, you'll get really stretched textures. It looks really terrible. So one of the interesting things to be aware of with triplanar texturing, you, know, you guys have probably seen it. In fact, this screenshot was posted to me from a player asking me what this was. That's why I actually included this section in this, in this panel. Um, you can get ghosting. So notice that the, uh, in the middle of the, of the picture, you have those, just two images of the, of the brick texture. Yeah, um, that that is due to the triplanar texturing. You've got you know, a texture here and a texture on the other plane. They're, they're both sort of competing, and the, the engine can't know which one Jim and a month posted that. blends more than the other. Ah. Uh, something you can do to try and enhance it, but really just wow. being aware of it as a builder, you can kind of avoid those things. 